We literally have a sticker, a concerto sticker that says it takes a village of microbes because we <laughs> we also believe that it takes more than one microbe to do anything useful in biology. Um, yeah, we love our communities of microbes that are working together to keep us healthy. The microbial world within each of us has been incredibly difficult to see until now. From the depths of our intestines to the surface of our skin, our bodies are host to trillions of microbial cells spanning thousands of species. While critical to helping us to fend off illnesses and digest complex foods, we know very little about the complicated interactions among these microbes. For this episode, our special guest is Dr. Sherry Ackerman, CEO, co-founder of Concerto Biosciences. Her team has put in place a key step in advancing the understanding of ourselves, a system called the K-Chip that enables measurement of the interactions that occur among a multitude of microbial species. Let's dive in. Welcome to Tough Tech Today with Mayan and Miller. This is the premier show featuring trailblazers who are building technologies today to solve tomorrow's toughest challenges. Hi, everyone. It's my honor to welcome Sherry Ackerman on Tough Tech Today. Sherry is the CEO of Concerto Biosciences, uh, which is reinventing humanity's relationship with microbes. We're really excited to dive deep into the actual company, the technology, and a little bit of Sherry's background today. So let's get to it. Awesome. So Sherry, this, <laughs> we, we have heard that you are working on something called K-chip devices. Um, can you give us the, the lay of the land, what this is? Um, I presume it's not something edible um, and, and uh, kind of go into the, the so what behind this. Sure. Yeah, um, maybe it's good to start with how this type of device is actually applied. Like, what do you actually do with it? Um, so we invented this technology at MIT and the motivation for creating K-Chip was we understood that the, the microbiome, which are all of the microbes that live in, on, and around us, um, is a very complex ecosystem where um, the way that any one individual microbe works depends on the other microbes that are around it or the environment that that microbe lives in. And the problem, if you want to study that experimentally, is that it just becomes literally millions, billions of experiments that you would have to run. Because if you have one microbe and you want to know, okay, well, what if I put it in the presence of this other microbe? What about a different microbe? What about this one experimental condition or some other condition? This is, it's a combinatorial problem. Um, and you end up, yeah, with billions of things that you have to be able to test. So then the question is, how do you actually physically set up all of those experiments? Um, the way that you might think to do it is let's try to use a robot. So we'll just program a robot to, into you know, well number one of a 96 well plate. We're going to put microbe one and microbe two. Well number two, we're going to put microbe one and microbe three, et cetera, and array out all of these microbes. Theoretically, this works OK, um, except microbes are growing the whole time that you're trying to set up your experiment. So you suddenly end up with these massive batch effects Plus, if you do the math um, of combinatorial problems, um, it, it just is literally too many things to test. So as an example, if you have a microbiome that has a thousand microbes in it and you want to measure all of the possible pairs, so make every possible set of two and then measure how each of those work, that's half a million measurements that you would have to make. And if you make those more complex, say out to sets of four, you're now talking about billions of different possible combinations and you need to measure each one of, make and measure each one of those combinations to understand how all these microbes are working together. So this issue of combinatorial experiments, how do you physically set up combinatorial experiments? That's what KCHIP was designed to solve. Um, and how we're using it today is that we, um, basically have these libraries of microbes or different conditions that microbes can grow in. 
and then we make all of the different possible combinations, measure them all, and feed that into a computer algorithm that allows us to then say, well, like if you have this thing, this thing, and this other thing that we didn't test, can we predict how that combination would behave? And can we pull out the best combinations to put into specific products um, that will do useful things for people? And those can be things like, um, let's make a combination of microbes that, um, that we can use to treat eczema, which is one of our early applications. Or let's make a combination of microbes that you could use to treat recurrent vaginal yeast infection. Um, so kind of a long answer, but that's the overview of why the technology matters. And I can tell you more about how it works as well, if that's of interest. Yeah, that would that would be great. I think just even taking a taking a step back, like, could you help us understand what the range of types of microbes you can test in the system? I mean, there's of course lots of bacteria, many types of species. What what are the what is that class that you are focusing on, or what are the limitations here? And, and just want to learn more about that side. Yeah. Um, so ketchup was originally designed to work in oxygen. It was designed to work on the soil microbiome. So the original papers, we isolated, we, my co-founder, who is a graduate student at MIT at the time, um, isolated microbes literally from Killian Court at MIT and um, put these into K-chip. They grow just fine. And um, so all of the same growth kinetics that you would see on a 96 well plate is exactly what you see in K-chip from the microbes perspective. Um, the volume issue is like not not a problem at all. Just so I want to understand, Sherry, what are some of the, what, the define like microbes in that space for us? And what are some of the what are the sort of types of microbes that the K-chip can test? What are the limitations of that space? Um, how many combinations can it test? Just trying to understand the boundaries of the technology. From the, the question of what counts as a microbe, bacteria, fungi, viruses, phages, Things that we've actually put onto K-chip, bacteria, fungi, um, plenty of genetic material as well, just straight up DNA. We haven't actually played much with viruses or phages, although there's no reason to believe that it wouldn't work. And then in terms of which types of bacteria, which types of fungi, they can be, they can come from anywhere. Originally, the chip was designed to work in oxygen. We designed it using soil microbes. But then we've also been adapting it to anaerobic conditions. So now you can we can grow things like gut derived microbes um, on the chip and, and it works just fine. And then in terms of the limitations of size. So the way that the chip works, it is a micro well array. Um, so you can think of it like a 96 well plate. In fact, it's the size of a 96 well plate, except it has 100,000 wells on it and each well holds somewhere between one and seven-ish micro, or sorry, nanoliters. Um, so it's very, very small volumes in order to make that geometry fit. Well, I wanna know before we get too far away from it, did your co-founder yeah. find anything interesting in Killian Court? I imagine you could, <laughs> uh, the, the microbiome of, uh, you know, a court, you know, where you see a lot of student traffic could be a little interesting. That probably is true. We definitely weren't looking for anything. Um, we were looking at microbial ecology, right? So we're looking at how do these microbes metabolize different sugar sources in order to be able to grow together. Um, I can tell you things like he found a whole bunch of facilitation, a whole bunch of competition, like all of the different possible relationships you would, you would imagine. Mm -hmm. uh, you can find them out in nature, which is very cool. I can't make any conclusions about the undergrads at MIT uh, okay. based on the <laughs> microbes we found. I imagine so like the, the boba tea, you know, could be a sugar source. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> I, I'm thinking through um, this, like, you mentioned K-chip, and is this a, uh, a physical, uh, or I know it's a physical aspect, but um, could you describe that? Could it be, be the eyes for, for our, our viewers and our, and our listeners, what that what that is. Yeah, it is a plastic, a flexible plastic chip that is the size of a smartphone. If you know what a 96 well plate is, it is mm. literally the size of a 96 well plate. Um, it is 
about this thick and um, it the way that we make it is through a mold process so the plastic that it's made out of starts as a liquid um, and you pour it into a mold and then it hardens and you peel it off and then when you peel it off there are all of these little tiny wells that are in the surface of that chip and those wells are big enough that you can see that the surface of the chip is fuzzy but small enough that you can't really see each one individually. Hmm. So then is this something that, uh, this may go into some of the, 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 the sort of revenue generating aspects of, of Concerto, um, in, is it that we could, uh, could, could sell the, that sort of physical hardware and maybe some, some sort of analytical capabilities on top of it to a pharma company, for example? Um, as an option one, option two, perhaps being able to to uh, uh, operate, uh, keep the the K chip uh, sort of physically in house, but but having other folks contributing their fungal or bacterial strains for analysis or something um, there, and then Concerto can can share those results, the data, and then the third being all in house, like a vertical um, integrated approach to make. Concerto's own kind of uh, ointments or, or drugs or something. How, right. Can you walk us through those kind of three, three or more pathways that, that you have ahead of you? Yeah, we actually decided pretty early on that we're not going to do the version of the company that would be build the box and sell the box. So we don't make K-chips that other people could buy and bring in-house. Um, a big part of that is that the technology itself is still um, like you need a very specific kind of microscope. You need to be able to make the nanoliter droplets that go into the chip and all of the this specialized um, hardware plus understanding how do you actually design a K-chip discovery campaign in a way that will get you statistically meaningful results. Because as soon as you start um, testing, you know, many, many, many chips, you're getting millions of data points. And this is a, a type of like experimental design that most scientists don't play in very much. So we've actually chosen, uh, we like to have it in-house and be the partner for another company that can generate this type of data at a volume um, and, and a price point that isn't really available anywhere else. So we do have our own internal discovery projects. Those eventually will be out licensed. We don't anticipate that we're going to be the company that's selling to, you know, a, a farmer or to a doctor or something like that. We work with other companies, whether we're out licensing the more developed assets or we're starting from the very beginning with a partner who has an idea, oh, we'd like to develop this thing from microbes, can we work with you? And now we have a data set that we wouldn't have had access to before. And then from Concerto's perspective, um, we get the expertise from that partner on what do their customers really want? And maybe they have expertise in running clinical trials or things like that. Um, and that is super helpful for us. Yeah, so Sherry, what you described very much is like, yeah, that early part of R&D you want, the, the sort of R you want to be, R&D I guess you want to be focused on and then really finding the partners to bring it to mm -hmm. market. Um, which makes a lot of sense. If we come back to um, the, the K chip, the actual physical like device, you mentioned you're gonna you're, you'll have maybe like millions of these chips running and figuring out all sorts of combinations of these microbes. Um, are there what are what are some challenges with like manufacturing the chip? Is there is this like a sort of a standard microfluidics thing that is we have a lot of like uh, I don't know like manufacturing capabilities for? Or what's what are some of the the, the constraints around uh, making it's like millions of these? Yeah, so we, we fortunately do not need to make millions of the chips. That would be a huge undertaking. Okay. What we can do is make tens to hundreds of chips, which each one has 100,000 experiments on it. So then multiply that out and you end up with millions of data points that are coming off of tens to hundreds of chips. In terms of the manufacturing side, we make them in-house okay. and it's a very standard soft lithography you happen to know what that is process yeah. um, they're made out of um, PDMS okay. what's I guess building on Malvika's question what what is the what is the toughest 
technical challenge you've had to solve to, to bring your dream to reality. So the invention of the chip was actually done before me. Um, I am one of the inventors of the later development of the chip, but the original invention was made by Jared Kay um, and Tony Colasa, Paul Blaney at MIT. I think in terms of getting it out into Concerto, one of the tougher technical challenges has been adapting it to an anaerobic environment. And that's not just getting the chip into an anaerobic chamber, which you can definitely do totally fine. It's also figuring out how do you read out the biology on the chip? Because if you know anything about green fluorescent protein, GFP, which is what everyone uses to study microbes, GFP requires oxygen to mature. GFP does not fluoresce in an anaerobic environment. So this workhorse of a, a genetic tool that every microbiologist works with is suddenly not available as soon as you want to um, measure what microbes are doing in an anaerobic environment using microscopy, which is exactly what we're trying to do. Um, so it's been a lot of working around basically developing new strategies for assays to, that will work under those conditions which we have done and it works, which is great. And what is that? What, yeah, that's great. What does that <laughs> open up in terms of like additional uh, markets? Uh, just paint, paint that picture for like now being able to have this capability. What can you yeah. do? Is it other types of, yeah, like gut or what new, new environments? Yeah. Just, just curious how that, how that changes the game now. Yeah, it was super important. So things that were accessible before, were things like skin microbiome, plants, um, a subset of the vaginal microbiome, mm -hmm. it was like microaerophilic, um, lots of things that happen in water as well. Things that were not accessible, oral microbiome, um, all of the things that cause plaque and gingivitis um, are either anaerobes or the environment where they grow in your mouth um, is pretty anaerobic. Most of the vaginal microbiome actually grows anaerobically. So if we want to look at things like, um, you know, preterm birth and STI transmission, bacterial vaginosis, those are, are all, you need the anaerobic conditions to make, make that happen. And then, oh my goodness, so much gut microbiome that's now accessible. So these are things that um, you probably have already heard about in the news, like C. diff infection, that series and rebiotics have been working on. Um, mm -hmm. as well as Finch, Vedanta, you know, for a long time and have now seen success, right, which is super cool for the field, to things that are really hard to address. We know that there are associations between, for example, the microbiome and autism, Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease. How do we actually begin to understand that biology? Um, I think the even the ability to work in the gut microbiome, like we'll see if those are things that Concerto can ever take on that complexity of biology, but it's, it's everything that has a tie into the gut, which can be immune things, gut brain axis, um, all kinds, gut, gut and cancer actually is another area that people are really interested mm -hmm. in with the microbiome. Um, yeah, metabolic diseases, diabetes, all kinds of stuff. And I just want to jump on one more question, but then I'll let mm -hmm. the others talk. But you mentioned the right the complexity of these microbiomes, and if we think about the skin, right, you with with which your lead prod, product is trying to address with eczema, um, mm -hmm. like how like just paint the picture of like how many types of microbes are on our skin, and now we're gro now you're growing it in these little micro wells. Like how well is that really approximating? I don't know, maybe the thousands of types of microbes and growing on a larger surface. Like how are you? like that, that sort of standard, like in vitro, in vivo correlation, how are you really mm -hmm. addressing that? Yeah, and it's a huge problem in the field because when we look at animal models too for our microbiome, how do we begin to approximate what these microbes are actually experiencing mm -hmm. on the surface of the skin, in the gut, et cetera, in our experimental models? So I would say that what the way that we get around this is actually by testing just hundreds of thousands of millions of different conditions. So when we find 
a group of microbes that looks like it's going to perform this desirable function. So as an example, we, this, we've been working on eczema. Um, the underlying biology of eczema involves the bacterium Staphylococcus aureus, Staph aureus. Mm -hmm. And Staph aureus will grow on the surface of skin. It will secrete toxins and proteases that break apart the skin and aggravate an immune response. So what we were looking for were three microbes that when Staph is grown in the presence of those microbes, Staph aureus doesn't produce those toxins, those proteases. So even if Staph is present on the skin, you can put these microbes on the skin and now Staph is pacified, it's under control. When we found the different groups of microbes that could possibly perform this function, right? Under one set of conditions, we observed them performing this function. We then took that same set of microbes and exposed it to hundreds of thousands of potential conditions that it might encounter on the surface of skin. So we threw it into our biobank of all the different microbes that we isolated from human skin and asked, in the presence of all of these different microbes, does this group continue to function? So was any one of those conditions a good proxy for skin? everywhere. No, but by testing it against all of these different conditions, we have a pretty good idea of which microbes found on the surface of skin will contribute to what we're trying to get this ensemble of this collection to do and which ones might get in the way of what this group of microbes is trying to do. Um, and then we can also do the same thing with nutrients. So if this, we expect that on the surface of skin, these microbes are going to encounter certain sugars, amino acids, different compounds that are found in you know, lotions that people use, et cetera. We can expose, use K-chip to make all of the different combinations of the different nutrients that might be found on skin and ask how well does this group of microbes inhibit Staph aureus in all these different possible conditions. Um, so it's not really a question of is any one particular well on K-chip a good proxy for skin. It's more like if we can throw all of these different possible conditions that it might encounter at mm -hmm. this ensemble and then ask if it keeps working, it's a pretty good pr proxy for it's gonna keep working even if we put it on skin later. Good. That's super yeah. helpful. Makes sense, yeah. yeah. Is, is that then that, that a lot of the uh, value creation of Concerto is in um, amassing this library from the profile of Killian core to vaginal swabs to skin conditions. And, mm -hmm. and then furthermore, like, so that a pile of data that hasn't previously been, a, been acquirable or at least not at scale, and then yeah. getting into a better sort of almost predictive capability so that um, uh, drug makers or treatment people would be able to say, okay, we can down select from thousands upon thousands, thousands times thousands of possible ways of, of treating eczema to maybe the 10 most likely to work kind of approaches. Is it that kind of a, a, a sort of a sense of value creation and capture? Yeah, exactly. So the size library, when we started our eczema discovery campaign, we started with a library of microbes um, that was around I think 1700 or so. If you look at all of the possible combinations that we would have had to test to down select to our top now lead candidate for this therapeutic, it comes out to something like 800 million things that we would have had to test. And we can use K-chip to explore a subset of those, kind of learn a little bit about the landscape, um, down select a little bit more, learn a little bit more, down select a little bit more. And so it allows you to sift through what otherwise would be a completely intractable number of combinations down to actually finding what is the best combination of microbes that you want to put into a cream that will help someone with their eczema. And so when you generate all of this um, this data, is this, is this owned by your partner customer or does this go into a, a library of data that's owned by your company? Obviously everything that we do internally, when we take on the discovery ourselves, we own all of the data. 
When we partner with another company, that's part of the negotiation, actually. And we think that it's very important for us to be able to at least be at least be able to take the data and put it into our database. Um, there are plenty of companies that obviously don't want their data to be specifically accessible to a potential competitor or something like that. Um, and we can protect against things like that too. But it's, it's interesting actually, ownership and um, terms like that are just always part of negotiating. Uh, <laughs> almost anything can be purchased. <laughs> <laughs> and as CEO, you probably have to do a lot of that work ironing out those terms. For sure. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. And it's really important. I mean, our partners are incredibly important to us. So we want them to get what they need out of a partnership. And for some partners, access to the raw data is super important. And then for other partners, they don't care that much about the data that drove to that discovery or that recommendation of these are, you know, the top 50 combinations, what they care about is, well, which ones are the top 50 combinations? Uh, and it's just about understanding what the partner is really looking for, where they, how and where they would drive value. You, you mentioned earlier, right, there's met, there's sort of the, the field of the microbiome and a lot of it focused on therapeutics, understanding also there's like sort of the agriculture application as well that mm -hmm. I, I think your company is also exploring. Um, could you talk a little bit about that angle too? So not just the sort of biotherapeutic side, but also the, the ag tech application. Yeah, there are two major areas where people tend to apply microbes in agriculture. One is biocontrol. So replacing pesticides and herbicides, things like that, with microbes. And uh, bacterial pests, fungal pests are the ones that are a huge problem that are readily addressable by we can just put the right microbes on the leaf of a plant or in the soil such that this you know mold or whatever can't grow in that location. Um, the other major category is biofertilizer. So if you want to fix nitrogen, carbon, um, make more nutrients available to the soil, that's you know another area where microbes are very good at doing that naturally. And so then how do we take those natural processes and either amplify them or um, you know make sure that the right microbes that perform those processes are present? That's a major um, subset of how microbes are used in agriculture. And in terms of the maturities in this space of using these um, ensembles of microbes as either therapeutics or as like biofertilizers, like what is um, what what is the precedent right now? You, you mentioned series therapeutics and the recent approval there, mm -hmm. but um, and how how is that going to you know really how is that maybe helped or de-risk some of the clinical aspects of what you're trying to do or in the ag tech field? Um, how is that, what, what's the, is there anything approved as like the, the micro product there? And, and uh, yeah, just want to understand like that precedence for, for these kinds of therapeutics or, uh, or, or ag agriculture applications. Right. On the therapeutic side, there are exactly two and they are uh, Rebiotics' product and Series Therapeutics' products. Um, those are derived from fecal matter, um, as opposed to, I think there's another strategy, which is let's build these from, let's build these ensembles or consortia from the ground up. So we're gonna take this mm -hmm. microbe plus this other one, plus this other one. Um, that strategy, it, People are working on it. Tons of companies are working on it, but nothing has made it all the way through to approval yet. Um, single strain strategies are also pretty common, although the like success or efficacy of those in, on the therapeutic side has been um, maybe a little bit more limited. So it'll be interesting to see the companies that are pursuing that strategy, how far any any of those companies um, get. I think on the agriculture side, single strain has been the majority of products. Um, there are some that take single strains and then combine them. Um, but the idea of making um, these combinations of microbes is somewhat less common. And 
often people see it as a manufacturing a cost of goods issue where mm -hmm. if you're gonna if you have to make one product where now you're manufacturing these different strains and then you have to combine them together all of a sudden your product just got three times or four times more expensive so there are also companies that are working on how do we do co-fermentation so that we can get these defined ratios of microbes out of a single fermentation process and I think there's a lot of value to be added there, not just in, I think we feel it most acutely in agriculture because the margins in ag are so small compared to therapeutics, but it will also drive down the cost and make it a lot easier to produce on the therapeutic side too. Is, is this something then that with, um, uh, that there's some overlap in the Venn diagram within synthetic biology where fermentation challenges are considerable to be able to, to uh, grow or, or cultivate at scale these these engineered microbes and where uh, Concerto's technology would be able to potentially help uh, increase the lifespan or growth span or whatever um, to be able to to so that we can have not just for therapeutics but also for non-medical uh, purposes of, of biologics that could start to to um, in some ways start to replace parts of the chemical industry with the, the comp complex molecules that biology inherently likes to, to burp up. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think figuring out how to optimize synthetic biology outputs has been a major challenge in the field. And you see companies like Ginkgo, right, which have made their entire business on optimizing the genetic circuits that pump out these very special molecules um, and very useful molecules. Then the question is, can you also optimize a, a microbe that has been engineered to produce something that it wouldn't normally produce? Can you optimize that microbe using its environment? So put, you know, which different kinds of sugars are you going to feed to this microbe? And can that change the yield of your uh, engineered microbe or um, is there another microbe you can add to the fermentation process that for whatever reason is helping maybe it's removing a waste product that this microbe would make or maybe it's providing some cofactor that like we don't even know that this microbe needs right but you can find these things experimentally just by taking this um, genetically engineered microbe and uh, co-culturing it with all of these other natural microbes and asking how does the yield of your desirable product change in the presence of these communities. Um, in the case of then having to do the co-culture for the fermentation itself, I can tell you there are probably fermentation engineers that would be listening to this just cringing thinking about trying to keep a co-culture in a defined fer fermenter running the way that they want it to and not having this ecology like go sideways. Um, but I think there is space there, right? If, if it turned out that we could get a major yield boost, then maybe it is worth it to do co-cultured fermentation. I think we're really early days on that. I think it, um, optimizing the growth conditions and like the nutrients, micronutrients, metals, sugars, things to, to optimize a synthetic circuit that's something that's much more tractable right now. So I'm kind of curious, um, on like the delivery mechanism for, for some of these products. Um, so for example, like the eczema product, is it a, is it like a, like a cream, like a yogurt, uh, type thing that you put on your skin or can you describe that? We do use the analogy of yogurt to help people understand just how safe it is. Um, so you would, you would never be concerned about rubbing yogurt on your skin, it contains billions of microbes. It'd be totally fine. Um, we are actually still working on the formulation for this. So the possible formulations could be as wide as, um, for example, a spray. There's a company called Aobiome, Mother Dirt, that has a spray of a nitrosomonas that you just literally, you can spray it on your face, spray it on your arm. Um, there are other companies that have um, done things like creams, oils. The main thing is for the microbes that we're working on, we need them to not be exposed to water. So they need to be somehow dehydrated. 
um, in order to be shelf stable. And because we otherwise you run into cold chain issues of, oh, we have to keep them frozen or refrigerated and nobody wants to keep their lotion in the freezer. <laughs> like, that's not really a thing. Um, so formulation is a huge issue in, in this field and we're working on it right now. We'll see where we end up. So in, in, in uh, th this past fall, uh, Concerto raised, I understand, um, over $20 million as part of the, the Series A. And um, in that, 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 that is a, a, a predominant focus is on, on uh, setting the foundation for the, the eczema play, as well as, I imagine, the, the overall sort of platform, which in, in biotech land is, uh, as well as in other, other fields, um, sort of communities are like, like, build the platform, not the product kind of thing. Um, how, as CEO, uh, how are you thinking about the ways of being able to almost handle two very different levels of zoom, so to say, zoom in very close to make a, a tactical product that, that would need to perform well in the market to selling to the average Joe consumer. And also at the, the 10,000 foot view, so to say of, of, you know what, now we can, we've, we've successfully demonstrated one play, one area. Now we're going to do it um, times two, times three, times four in other markets. Mm -hmm. right, walk us through that. Yeah. The unifying principle is that Concerto operates throughout licensing. So everything that we do, we're not going to be the people that bring it to the end customer. In the case of the eczema product, we're doing enough on that product to make it something that another dermatology company would look at and say, that's really valuable. I wish that I had that in my portfolio. There are other areas where companies are more willing to jump in from the very, very beginning. So for example, in agriculture, we've seen a lot of early traction where um, a company will come with, with more of a concept. Like, I wish that I had a set of microbes that could deal with this particular you know, fungal issue or this biofertilizer issue. And we work from the very, very beginning. But again, it's an outlicensing model in the sense that we are not going to take this product all the way to the farmer. The other company will take it forward after we work together to figure out what the product is going to be. And then from that, it just becomes a portfolio optimization problem where, you know, how much money are you going to have to sink into any one asset in order to get it to a point where you can start getting revenue back in, which in our case is going to come from a license. And what is the final value of that product versus the risk of that product not panning out at all and the time it's going to take to get there, right? So it becomes this like multivariable um, portfolio optimization problem. And I don't think there's any, there are certainly books and books and books that are written on the math of how to do this. But from just a, a sort of armchair philosophy standpoint, you can, you meet people all the time who have lots of different ways of thinking about these types of problems and whether it's better to just focus on that one asset, get that one asset, the proof of concept, really, really solid, out license it and then, you know, make a billion dollars. Or if it's better to be more diversified. And in our case, I think we're choosing a slightly more balanced approach where we do have second, third, fourth projects that are running, um, but that can't come at the expense of the first area because that first area is what's going to validate that our discovery approach was good in the first place. Um, so that's why it's so valuable to push that first asset all the way to actually getting data in, in our case, in people, um, in ag, it would be in the field or whatever. When, when might we be able to uh, have the, the eczema yogurt on, on our skin? On your skin. So <laughs> we're going, we are going the FDA, route. So that means phase one, phase two, phase three clinical trials. Typical timelines for that are something around 10 years. In dermatology, it's a little bit shorter. So I would say you're going to have to hang on until probably the, the late 2020s. Okay. Okay. Yeah. That's great. And Sherry, one, one, one question that jumped up when Jamil was asking about the platform and 
you know, thinking about investments into the, into that. My understanding is, right, you reach this, you, there, were, there were published papers um, from, from the MIT work on with, with the K chip, and then you know you, you you then built the anaerobic capability. What are some of these other like big technical uh, sort of milestones that you want to demonstrate with the platform? Is it focused on adding more like assays, uh, trying to figure out like what what you can measure from this chip, like adding sequencing or or uh, adding even more? Um, I don't know other like you said you mentioned like phages, viruses, like adding a lot more complexity in the diversity of microbes. Like what is like walk us through a little bit of like that technical milestones like what are some of those upcoming ones you see yeah. um, as priorities yeah we tend to prioritize technical development based on the products we're going after so we develop new assays as needed based on the type of biology we're trying to address on the person in the field etc in terms of so we talked about the anaerobic development earlier mm -hmm. That was really important for unlocking this entire type of microbiome, right? Now we can access the gut microbiome, which wasn't a thing before. There's another sort of, I, I would say, okay, actually no. So we were accessing the anaerobic microbiome as like, this is a whole new area that we couldn't get to before. So now we can access aerobic and anaerobic microbes, which are basically the two types of microbes. Right. Mm -hmm. Then there's another type of um, development that we're working on, and that is just throughput. So this isn't trying to make K-chip be able to do something it couldn't do before. It's literally just making K-chip faster. The way that K-chip was originally designed was be, to be used by a person. So you you use an, a different microfluidic device, not the chip itself, a different device to make all of these nanoliter droplets that end up in the chip. And then you pull them all together manually and then physically pipette them into a flow space that goes underneath the chip and then physically just like rock the chip around so that all these droplets will flow over the chip. And, and you can think of them like marbles that are like falling into cups. That process is super manual, requires a human. Humans need to sleep and eat and robots don't. So we, we think a lot about how do we take this very manual process and make it more automated. So imagine if you could have a person um, sitting at home, designs an experiment. There are literally robots that go to a freezer, pull out the microbes that we want to test. They get made into droplets automatically they get loaded into a K-chip, the K-chip goes on the microscope, all the pictures get taken automatically, get beamed up to the cloud. Like what would it take for us to get to that version of running K-chip and, mm -hmm. and what's the sort of scale we can expect if we can do that? That's, that I think is a very cool problem, but it's very different from new capabilities like new assays or, or things mm -hmm. like that. And it's also something, the automation thing is something we're actively working on right now. The, there's a considerable amount of responsibility that, that you have as CEO of this growing company. Um, what are some of the uh, some of the experiences that you've had prior that that you've been able to to lean on to help you be able to 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 sail this ship because it's it's working on new technologies, um, mm. complex fields. There's a lot of uncertainty there. How do you yeah. manage that? Obviously, my technical training is a huge piece of this um and i don't just mean that from the perspective of i can i have a pretty good intuition of what will probably work what will probably not work on the k-chip that's a very useful thing to know when talking to potential partners but i also mean that from the perspective of having a having technical training just helps you be good at solving problems. And my experience of being a CEO is just having to learn to do my job faster than whatever the company needs me to be able to do. <laughs> so if you had asked me to lead the company now, but with the experience that I had two years ago, I would fall flat on my face because I, over the last two years have grown to be 
the person with the experiences that can actually lead the company where we are now. And I think for me, it's always trying to, I'm always trying to figure out who do I need to become six months from now? And how do I invest in those experiences that I need in order to be that person by the time six months from now arrives? And a lot of trying to find the answer to that question is actually talking with advisors. I'm in like a, a CEO roundtable group, um, making sure that I am doing the meta work of not just doing my job, but figuring out what my job is going to be six months from now and that I'm going to have the skill set that I need to do that job then. And, and that I honestly think like comes a lot out of my PhD training of seeing the bigger picture of problems and not just um, how am I going to solve this thing, but how does this thing fit into the larger story of the bigger picture problem I'm trying to solve. Um, all of that willingness to experiment and um, take data on what's the experiments that I'm running like with my team, for example, the way that we run our company, is that working? Is that not working? Should we be trying a new organizational structure? Should we be trying new communication methods? Um, all of that comes because the co-founders of Concerto are scientists. So when we think about even our organizational problems, we're thinking about them from a scientific, sort of scientific method perspective. Can you talk to us a little bit about the, the origin story about the company? I don't, we've, don't know if we've had a chance to dive super deep into that. We spun the company out from the Broad Institute, which is at MIT and Harvard for people who are not in the Boston, Cambridge area. The technology was originally invented in Paul Blaney's lab at Broad and MIT. And the way that we got started on the company was Jared Kay, who's one of the inventors, basically asked me, hey, do you want to see if we can commercialize this thing that we're working on in lab? And I had come into my postdoc very open with Paul about the fact that maybe I want to start an academic lab, maybe I want to um, actually start a, a company. And he was totally cool with that. And so we started doing a whole bunch of different accelerators and incubators. Um, we did the MIT had a, a biotech startup thing that ran for just January that we did that Tony Colesso started. And then we did the Harvard Nucleate Activator program. That was like a 12 weeks of, let's learn what a competitive landscape is and how does IP work? And it would, for us, it was really just figuring out what vocabulary exists in the industry and then connecting with a whole bunch of mentors and expanding our network. Um, that was the spring of 2019. We spent a lot of the summer and fall of 2019 trying to figure out um, where we could possibly get money and what our actual market was and who our customers could be. And then going into 2020, we got our first money two weeks after Boston shut down for the pandemic. <laughs> and that money was gonna become available on June 1 of 2020. And we took it and decided to leave Broad um, and and became Concerto on June 1 of 2020. Wow. Was it was it scary taking that final leap and kind of leaving the nest, starting the company full time? <laughs> you know, people ask me this all the time and the answer is no. I was super excited about it. We had a co-founding team of four amazing people. Um, and we all trusted each other really deeply and we were completely complementary to each other. Like none of our backgrounds were remotely the same. Um, and yeah, it was, was like, oh, we have the money to do it, let's try. And I was very excited about it, yeah. Mm -hmm. So you, got, you started as this team of, you know, technical, I guess, you know, nerds from you know, who built the technology and how have you mm -hmm. as a CEO, right, with that deep technical background and now this, you know, this whole founder scientist movement, like how have you picked up sort of that other side of the, 
the job that you that it entails that that business aspect that acumen that a lot of people get just from experience like what if how have you who, who are some mentors or you don't have to name them but just what have you what are those experiences that you were mentioning that you've tried to have or how have you prepared yourself for that sort of business side yeah listening to people asking a lot of questions <laughs> And that started as early as the Nucleate Activator program. We were paired up with three mentors who, one of them is an observer on our board today. Um, the other two I consider to be friends and you know nominate us for awards and do all kinds of things to get us plugged into the larger, even still today, now four years later, right? Um, this network is incredibly tight and supportive in the biotech community and being able to ask them questions about what's normal, what's not normal. Um, the thing that I'm learning right now is much more the practical side of business development. So we recently hired um, a senior director of business development. He is phenomenal. Um, we have a fractional chief business officer, also fantastic. And it's been really amazing to watch these two people not just come in and um, like lead business development at Concerto, which they're definitely doing, but also help me and help the other co-founders see this is what's normal in business development. And these are the things that you can expect in this type of a conversation. Here's where we are in the um, story arc of, you know, how business development happens. And I think putting people around us who are willing not just to be really good at their jobs, but also to teach us this part of biotech that, how would I know? They're not looking down on us in, in any way, right? They're perfectly happy to explain this is what's going on in this situation and share what they see. And then we get to share what we see and understand from a technical perspective um, or from a team building perspective or all of the things that we've learned along the way too. Sherry, would, would you like to, to, to share as we, we come toward the, the end of our, our conversation together, a, um, uh, what, what you are, are looking out for um, to, to, to help Concerto? How, how can our listeners, viewers help? Um, are there particular positions that you're looking to fill? Um, this, is, this is your time to, 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 to let us know. Yeah, thank you. I would say what we're looking for right now are people who are interested in building microbial products. So people who work as scientists or in business development at other companies who see the potential for microbial technologies, maybe you don't have a microbiome program at your company, but there's interest there. Um, and trying to find these people and form collaborations with Concerto, make Concerto's technology available to you, make your expertise in your field available to us so we can make something together that we wouldn't have been able to make individually. Awesome. It, it, uh, the, the, the overused but always effective proverb of, of it takes a village to, to raise a child or a, or a startup. And so um, the collaborative yes. approach is certainly looks like the way to go. <laughs> we literally have a sticker, a concerto sticker that says it takes a village of microbes. Because we <laughs> we also believe that it takes more than one microbe to do anything useful in biology. Um, yeah, we love our communities of microbes that are working together to keep us healthy. Yeah. Well, and, and the, uh, the 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 name of the company Concerto certainly works well for the, the these these ensembles of, of, of microbes. From. Yeah, it's, it's a great it's name. A... It's like <laughs> Thank you so much for tuning in for this episode. We have a request, but first. We have in the works several episodes that are focused on emerging opportunities in space. And these are some things that we are really excited about. So join the mailing list and get notified when we have the next episode dropping soon. Anyhow, back to our request. We have been delighted so much to see you writing five-star reviews and sharing Tough Tech Today with your friends. If you've been enjoying this show, we do kindly ask you to consider supporting the show by joining our new membership plan. As many of you know, Forrest and I have been supporting the show out of pocket to date since the show's conception. We strive to provide you, our tough tech champions, 
a way to pay what you can to support the show's production. We have a link included in the show notes so you can take a look. We will continue to share the show for free. So if you can't afford to, to, to support right now, that's totally okay. Uh, but for those of you with some extra funds, consider supporting Tough Tech Today's continued production so that we can continue expanding the quality of content we produce while maintaining that high quality production across video, audio, and written media. You know, from recording equipment, transcription costs, production time, and all the little details that we are proud that goes into making each episode, the effort is substantial. And so we appreciate so much how many of you have noticed the consistent quality we have delivered. Until next time, stay tuned.